And we're in this series that um, I'm calling Thrive and Prosper. And the idea comes from 2 Corinthians 9, <clears throat> verses 10 and 11. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. I mean, that, I'm telling you, that is, a, that is like a, there is so much in one sentence right there. Increase the harvest of your righteousness. You have a righteousness that has been given to you, and that is the righteousness of Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Him. And that righteousness that He's given you, that state of existence that you have before the Father, is true. It's a reality. It's tr it, like if you were to, if this body were to just drop and whatever part of you moves on, moves on, it is in the condition that, it's, that it will be in forever. That spirit is in there and it's real and it's true and it's more real than this temporary junk. And that part of you is forever perfected and holy. And now the secret of Christianity is to let that aspect of you strengthen everything else and live within the power of that. Live worthy of what He's called you to. Amen? And so this is really kind of around that process. We're just talking about transformation. We're talking about mind renewal, putting on the new man in Christ, putting off the old man in your mind, knowing that you have the mind of Christ, knowing that you have been, a, a, a circumcision has been performed within you to remove that old dead heart, put a new heart, a new nature. Praise God. You're one with Him. Amen? And what He's trying to do is get His kingdom out of you into this earth, certainly affecting you in the process. Transformation. Amen? So He will, like in moments like that, in moments where you're taking time to get intimate with Him and engage with His living Word, His Spirit, that's what that, that's what, for me, that's what that is. You know, it's not just night. I mean, you know, how beautifully they played. You know, we got the air conditioned just right. You guys keep giving so we can afford the light bill. We got some pretty comfortable chairs, right? So all that's cool, but it's like, what's really happening on the inside of you between you and God? Amen. This is what He wants. In, the, in, in moments like that, can you let Him put those seeds in there? I, I, and I don't even know what that means for you. Right? The Spirit's got to teach you what that looks like, how He teaches you, how He leads you. We know that Jesus promised that when He ascended and He sent the Spirit, that that Spirit would teach you, lead you and guide you into all truth, remind you of what He taught you, show you things to come. There is a relationship that we are engaged in with the Spirit of God right now in this moment, and He's speaking to you. And he's doing things like this. He's sowing seed into you so you have seed to sow out of you. What seeds are he sowing? Is he sowing? Humility, patience, peace, you know, generosity, love, forgiveness, all of that stuff. All that stuff. He's sowing those things into you. He's placed his spirit in you, but there's an interaction with him that he's sowing God wants a harvest, and it comes out of you, and it's out of the righteousness that He's given you. That's why we live well. That's why we renew our minds. That's why we do what we do so that we outwardly reflect what He's inwardly doing. That's the whole, that's Christianity. That is expressing what He's done. Not trying to earn it, not trying to keep from losing it, but living within the reality of what He's done. Amen? And this is what he's doing. It's an ongoing process. God is a gardener, and he's busy. He is at work in you, in your heart, by his Spirit. He is at work leading. Are you putting your hands in his hands and working with him and letting him? Are you participating? Amen? Amen. I mean, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about this week, uh, this idea here. And so as a result of that, you will be enriched. Do you feel enriched? Like, do you feel refreshed and strengthened and oh, maybe you breathe a little bit deeper? That tightness in your shoulders might be gone a little bit, you know? It's like, okay, yes, Jesus, praise God. Praise God for physical relaxation, but an inner spiritual peace that just, man, everything else fails in comparison to that, right? And that's life. That is living. You can't get that from just knowing Scripture. You got to know Him. 
Nobody can teach you that but him. You will be enriched. Say enriched. enriched. In every way. How, where do you need to be enriched? Because every way includes that. He is sowing in you so that you will be enriched in every way. So that you will be generous in every way. You know, the kind of fruit that is birthed out of that righteousness, because that's what it's talking about. The harvest of your righteousness is increased. The harvest of your relationship with your Father is increased. The stuff that grows and comes out of you as you commune with God from an understanding of your right, that you are in right standing with Him, that you are His child. That relational, that relationship that you're experiencing and encountering in moments like that, that you can do it anytime you want to, get, will bear fruit more than you even need. There is so much holiness within you. You got more to spare that it just bur You know, I mean, I've been around people in there and I've heard people say like, man, you just, you make me want to be a better person. I'm like, well, that ain't me. It's the Holy Spirit, Right. But there's just that, they just bump up against what I'm experiencing. And it's like, man, I, I don't need this stuff in my life. You know I mean? That, that, you make me like, want, I don't want this stuff anymore, you know? Man, praise God. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us. So through you, he's working to produce thanksgiving to God. From who? Think about it. Who's the thanksgiving to God coming from, in response to you being enriched in sowing. Who's it coming from? I hope you haven't answered. Did that question not make sense? I believe it's coming from me. All right, so look, let me just break this down a little bit more. You'll be enriched in every way, right? So God's sowing things in you. You're going to be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And then there's thanksgiving produced from that to God. So whoever you're being generous to Amen. is thankful to God. Amen. Y'all knew that. Thank you're just you. testing me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what it looks like more than anything is our love for one another, united, shows the world, will convince the world that God sent Jesus into this earth. Amen. And will show the world who God really is, you know. As you experience your relationship with your Father intentionally engaged, knowing who you are in Him, it produces things within you that you display outwardly that the world looks at and thanks God for you. Do you have anybody thanking God for you? Amen. Or are they like, oh no, here it comes on again. <laughs> All right. This week is kind of part two of this idea of expanding your tents. Make room for God to move. Make room for God to move. And it's, and it's out of uh, this particular passage here, Isaiah 54, 2, which I went through this last week. Go back and listen to it. Enlarge the place of your tent. For us, the tent is where God dwells. God dwells in you. Ultimately, this is, a, this is an invitation to the Israelites after explaining what the Messiah would do and the kind of covenant that God will now bring Israel into as a result of the Messiah being in the earth and all the stuff that happens in Isaiah 53, the great exchange. God invites them as a result of the Messiah being described to increase their tents because He's got big things He wants to do through them. And it's not just this nylon tent that's made or whatever it is. The tent is your heart. You are the tent. You. He's inviting you to increase, to stop limiting Him. Enlarge the place of your tent. Enlarge your heart. Stretch out the curtain of your dwellings. Do not hold back. Say, don't hold back. Don't hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. He's like, man, I'm telling you, trust me. I want to be a blessing to the nations of the earth through you. Yes. And what I need you to do is quit limiting me. Because that's what they did. The Israelites limited God in the desert for 40 years 
roaming around and that first generation had to die off and the young generation that all they knew was being fed by God supernaturally every day, follow a cloud, follow a fire, they'd been conditioned to just trust Him. The other boys didn't. Rightly so. I mean, they'd been in slavery for a long time. It just, you know, they just were entrenched. They were traumatized. But they limited God. God didn't limit Himself toward them. They limited God. They provoked Him. They tested Him in the desert. If you're not familiar with that story, go check it out. It's really interesting. When the, it's right after the Israelites are delivered out of Egypt. The story is there, and then it's also in Hebrews. He talks about it again. In Hebrews, he says, the reason they limited God was this. They didn't mix faith with the promise. Amen. God's got a promise. You've got to mix your faith with it. Your, your faith is the water on that seed, right? He, and then he brings the increase because it's encoded in there. I'm not saying you've got to get more faith. I'm not saying you've got to make it grow. All I'm saying is you've got to engage the promise. Actively believe. Like in worship we were doing, you know. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but man, I'm like, give me something to trust God about. Enlarge your heart, increase. And so this is what we're talking about. Last week we went through the miracle of the oil. The, there, so back, we read it last week in 2 Kings 4. The, there was a company of prophets, they called them, which was a group of people preserving the Word of God in very dark times for Israel. Elisha and Elijah were parts of these groups. It's almost like Bible studies, really. I guess, you know, you could call home churches. I don't know. But so there was a guy that was following Elisha, died, and his wife came to Elisha and said, Hey, your servant, my husband is dead. I'm broke. I don't have anything. I'm in debt, and they're about to come take my children and take them into slavery. What are we going to do here? What... You know, she's reaching out, and he says, first off, he says, what do you want me to do about it? And then he's like, well, what do you have in your house? So he starts with, what do you have? What do you have? Now, this is how God moves. This is how God works. He starts with something that's in you and with you. It's not, you know, we're all waiting for God to just sovereignly show up and create a stage for us because we're like, <laughs> once he does, does this, I'll do that. If he does this, I'll do that, like a cause and effect type thing. But really, he needs you to trust him to step into those things he's calling you into, right? And that oil, so if you don't know the story, he tells her, well, go, go. Uh, so what do you have? She says, I have this jar of oil, small jar of oil. He says, all right, let's use that. Boom, that's cues that she's got her heart open now. She don't know how it's going to work, but I've got this oil. I think I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to work with this right here. So he says, all right, fine, let's use that. Go get as many pots and jars as you can, bring them into the house and pour. And so what happens? Keeps pouring, keeps pouring until all the pots are full. Now, what if she had more pots? Now, I'm writing this chapter, and it's about, I know your theological perspective based on how you explain that miracle. Was it preordained, the amount of pots that were to be borrowed, and no more could have been filled? Was it already determined? You know, or maybe it was this. Well, you see, God provided just enough to meet the need because He doesn't want her getting extravagant and having too much oil here, right? <laughs> or, and that's oversimplification, I realize that, but, but there could be this too. What if she had more pots and, and jars? Amen. The oil kept going because it says that when the jars ran out, the oil ran out. What if there were more jars? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Is God capable of filling every jar on the planet with that one jar she had in her house? Could He do that? Why could He do that? Because He's God. Are you sure? That, that's, this is what we're talking about. It's like, oh, man, you know, He's huge. What's going on in your life? That's the same thing He wants for you. He is a provider. He didn't just say, oh, I, you know, I'm going to honor this woman because her husband served me, and so therefore I'm going to reward her with some oil. But just enough for her to pay her debts and live on a little bit after. Now it's like, that's what God wants for everybody. He said, don't ask for just a few. That's what He told her. Go get some jars and don't ask for just a few. This is what we got out of it. God used what she initiated. 
God used what was already in her house, like Moses. God calls Moses. Moses is like, now who are you? And he explains who he is. I am that I am. And Moses is like, well, no, I can't do it. So he's like really trying to get out of it. And then he finally gets Moses to a point where he's maybe willing to step into this. And Moses is like, well, how am I going to do it? God says, what's in your hands? Amen. Well, I got this staff that I've had for several years herding sheep out here. That's what we'll use. Whatever it is that you feel like, well, a slight possibility. Boom, God uses it. And what did God do? Ultimately, split the Red Sea through that staff, right? Yeah. Didn't he? Yes. I mean, the impossible happened with what Moses initially offered. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So that's where I want to go today. I want to go into that talking about George Washington Carver. You ever heard of him? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know more than I know about him. He's a really interesting fellow. We're going to read a bunch of his quotes. But this is the mindset. So we're talking about expanding your tents. Increase the capacity of your heart to trust Him. I'm not saying get more faith. you got the faith of Christ in you. Amen. What you need is confidence in who God is. Amen. Amen? Your confidence grows as you tune your heart and step into what he's leading you into. And you build a new track record with yourself where you actually trust that you can follow God because he's leading you. So these are the ideas we're, gonna, we're just kind of looking at before I look at these quotes from uh, GWC, we'll call him today. Matthew 7, 7, keep asking and it'll be given to you. Keep seeking and you'll find. Keep knocking and the door will be opened. That's Jesus. This, this is a principle, right? This is true in terms of truth. If it's a promise that relates to you, if it's a truth that remains, it's universally applied in Christ, you keep seeking until you experience that truth in your life. Are you with me? If, he, if you have a promise from God, and I don't mean an individualized, although you might have one of those too, but His promise comes out of His character. He is a healer. He is a provider. He is a comforter. He is your righteousness. What all is He? He's everything Jesus showed us. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, you can't really throw out that wrath and anger side of God. Well, we don't. You see that in Jesus too on the cross. Fully exhausted. Jesus took it all. I, 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 it's weird, people. Like, you say that. You say, well, Jesus... You can't look at God and look at Jesus and think that there's something that's not in Jesus that's in God, that He showed us how to live, right? Because He showed us love and forgiveness and mercy. Absolutely required righteousness, but then when they said, well, we can't live that way, He's like, aha, exactly. With you, it's impossible. With, with God, all things are possible. And He's talking about being saved by grace through faith. So we're just talking about this idea of increasing, expecting, seeking to let him enlarge your capacity so that he, so ultimately really for one idea, so that you're not limiting his will, so that you're not limiting what he wants to do through you. We know that we can because the Israelites did it, right? Didn't they? It's very clear. We can too. We don't want to do that. Say, I don't want to do that. Then this other idea here. This is a reality. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God and you'll give it to him. Will God give you wisdom? Yes. Amen. Do you seek him for wisdom? Yeah. Are you looking for information? I mean, how does it work for you? That, you know, I want you to answer that for yourself. Well, how does it work for you when you're dumb and you need some wisdom and you go to God and you get wisdom? Amen. All right, so let's look at this guy. I love this. There's some insights I just kind of want to lift out of this. George Washington Carver early 1900s. Uh, he was a, you know, some, some type of scientist, highly educated, actually very intelligent. But he had a habit of about four o'clock in the morning going out in the woods and walking with God every day. We're going to hear some quotes about how he thinks. But ultimately, what's accredited to him is uh, crop rotation. And so there was a problem with cotton depleting the soil of all its nutrients, and he knew that peanuts would enrich the soil. And so if we rotate 
Peanuts will enrich, we'll get a better yield from the cotton, and long term it will be, we'll get a better yield. But there was no money in peanuts, so he's trying to convince them this is what we need to do. And, and so he's working this out, and basically he goes to God and he seeks, okay, well, so how, how can I show them peanuts are profitable, worth growing, so that we can quit depleting our soil and have better cotton yield? And, and then he gets what most of us know, all of these incredible ideas from the peanut. Ultimately, like 300 Amen. patents, inventions, formulas, uses for the peanut. That's homework number two, I don't know, maybe. Go and look at all the stuff that that guy came up with, that God gave him. So, that, that, so God will give you wisdom when you ask Him. Here's a man that's a Christian. He's seeking God in his particular field. Let's just kind of look how he thinks about this. I, I love this. I really identify with some of these things he says here. I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station. All right, connect with this for a minute. I love to think of God as an, or nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. If we will only tune in, God is always speaking. Now, what he knew is the principle, and you see in Romans uh, 120, that we, that, that, that we can clearly understand the things that are unseen by the things which are seen. So he would observe nature and get insight into the spirit realm and get wisdom from God. Yeah, let's keep going because he just says some really interesting... So he's like a spirit led, charismatic, whatever those words are, type of Christian, but he's incredibly practical about it, okay? That's what I love about this guy, is it's not like a hand manifesting and writing on the wall, or he has something detached from his, him engaging in the world that he's already within. He basically just lets God into what he is into, and, and the increase happens, right? He, there's a co-laboring. He collaborates with God because we have a theology where we're like kicked back, sitting, waiting for God to show up and tell us what to do and do everything, make us do it. And if He doesn't make us do it, then He must not really want us to do it. There's kind of two approaches, Christianity. One is like, well, I'm just going to sit back. Life is going to happen. I'm going to do the best that I can. He might or might not speak to me. He might or may or may, or may not make this thing happen. I'm going to pray. It might not happen. I'm not sure if this is going to happen. And there's kind of a general confusion with that mindset. Or... You can just take God at His word that you are His child, you are His son, you are the righteousness of God in Him. You got that settled, that He is a healer, He is a provider, He is a comforter, and you're just going to believe that He is those things until you experience those things in your life. And you have every right to expect them, especially if you've taken the time to get your identity maturely rooted and grounded in His finished work where you're not squirrely out here living immature Christianity, still, you know, just strapped with sin, confused, afraid all the time. You know, once you, you get to that place, and I'm not talking about you become a better Christian, you just become better at understanding what He did to you when He put His Spirit in you. Amen. And you remain confident in that. And then out of that place, a relationship like this can happen. Are you with me? We got some work to do. Not to finish His work, but to repent and change the way that we think and renew our mind and put off the old man and put on the new man that is created after God in true righteousness and holiness. To you actually believe that you are truly righteous and holy and you quit worrying about all that stuff and then you just live with God engaged in this side of it. All right? So that's the way this guy thinks. He credits it to God. Let's read a few more. God is going to reveal to us things He never revealed before if we put our hands in His. Amen. It is sweet. That's like very poetic, right? But what does that look like for you? Whether you're selling ads or flying an airplane or building signs or working with your hands or cleaning toilets or whatever it might be. Are your hands in His hands as you are doing that thing, expecting the increase, 
expecting that this something greater than what I'm able to do can happen here. You know, I don't really know where this story came from, but I love this story. There's a story about this little kid that wobbles up on the stage of a concert pianist's stage. And they're freaking out because it's all set just right and the piano's tuned and the maestro's getting ready to come out and this little kid comes up and blink, 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 blink. And they're freaking out and the maestro says, don't worry about it. And he goes and he sits next to the kid and just creates this incredible masterpiece around that kid's efforts. That's you and that is your father. But you better get out there and start plinking. Not to make it happen, not to, you know, not to earn. You understand what I'm saying? We're removing the performance earned, performance righteousness out of it, but just living, moving, collaborating with God. God's going, uh, so no books ever, uh, ever go into my laboratory. The thing I am to do and the way of doing it are revealed to me. You know, it's, it, I kind of see this. It's like, there is the truth. There is a reality. And there is what God is seeking to establish in your life. And if you will sit with Him long enough and follow Him into this process deep enough and down far enough, you will get to the truth of that situation and it will be revealed to you. It's not a reward for spending time with Him where He says, okay, you got 27 minutes in today. Now I'm going to show you a little bit deeper secret. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about are, do you hold on to Him long enough where the confusion drifts and, and, and this, this manifestation of revelation happens within you. His Word is alive within you. That It's already there. You just start to see it more clearly is what we're talking about. He's not withholding. He's not needing you to jump through hoops and do something to get access to it. It's there. It's in you, in fact. But do you engage Him let go of the cares of this world, all the stuff, root your mind back on who He is, put on your identity in Him, settle yourself within Him, look in Him, stand on His Word. Oh, there it is. It's been there all along. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I never have to grope for methods. The method is revealed to me the moment I am inspired to create something new. Without God to draw aside the curtain, I'd be helpless. This is putting... Action to inspiration. We get, I'm telling you, you all get a, incredible ideas, but most of us don't act on them. Most of us do not take the time to put into practice the inspiration from God that would change our lives. First and foremost, internally, so that we reflect the type of character of Christ that is within us. You know, we're, we're busy dodging the world out here to take time. Most of us don't want to sit and own the sin that we keep messing around with anyway. We don't want to take time and sit and own it. You know, you got to be that thing before you can not be that thing. You got to admit to yourself, face yourself in the mirror and say, man, you know, this is what you're doing here. This is what you want. All right, let's keep going. Another quote from him. My prayers seem to be more of an attitude than anything else. I, I personally appreciate that. Amen. I indulge in very little lip service. Now, if you engage in a lot of lip service, it's okay. It's just this guy. But ask the, ask the great creator silently, daily, and often, many times a day, to permit me to speak to him through the three great kingdoms of the world which he has created. Now, this is his field He's in this daily as his job and his education. So this is kind of just where his mind naturally is. The animal kingdom, mineral, and vegetable kingdoms. To understand their relations to each other and our relations to them and to the great God who made all of us. I ask him daily and often momently to give me wisdom, understanding, and bodily strength to do his will. Hence, I am asking and receiving all the time. Amen. But it's about the attitude than the asking, than the words, right? It's just the general openness to God. God, I, you know, be, being still and acknowledging Him, acknowledging Him and being led by Him. And then being led by Him means you've got to actually take those steps. Whether you understand it or not, whether it scares you or not. And, and it's, you know, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I can't help you. 
you don't have to ask God to explain to you that dynamic of being led by the Spirit. Nobody can teach you how to be led by the Spirit. I don't care how many points they put into a weekend course. As I worked on my projects, uh, let's see, as I worked on projects which fulfilled a real human need, forces were working through me which amazed me. I would often go to sleep with an apparently insoluble problem. When I woke, the answer was there. Why then should we believe, why then should we who believe in Christ be so surprised at what God can do with a willing man in a laboratory? Willing. Well, God, I'm willing. I'll do anything you tell me to do. Well, did you do the last thing he told you to do? Uh, some things must be baffling to the critic who has never been born again. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> when I was young, I said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. But God answered, the knowledge, that knowledge is for me alone. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of the peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. <laughs> that's kind of anecdotal. There's some people who say that that question didn't actually happen. Because the peanut thing, I hate to burst your bubble on that one because it is nice to have that. But anyway, the peanut thing, he needed resolution on that because of the benefit of the soil to cotton and that whole thing. So let's keep going. Either way, this happened. When he did seek God, he did get this. He told me, remember, I know the peanut will enrich and benefit, but these people don't see the value of it, so I need you to tell me why this thing is valuable so I can show them the value of it so we can help this other thing that needs to be helped. Very specific thing that God's looking at here, and this is what or George is looking at, and this is what happens. He told me, separate the peanut into water, fats, oils, gums, resins, sugars, starches, and amino acids, then recombine these under my three laws of compatibility, temperature, and pressure. Then the Lord said, then you'll know why I made the peanut. 300 things. Lotion. Uh, peanut, come on, peanut butter. You got me again. No, I mean like things that you'd never even think about, right? Related to, I had a list that I forgot to put it in my notes, I guess, but anyway. So, okay, so now we've looked at, God will give you wisdom when you ask. He wants you to increase your tent. Increase the capacity. He doesn't want you to limit him. He's for you. He's seeking to be who he is through you. You have a part to play in this process. He, the, truth is constantly... The, the stuff that... Let's say it this way. The stuff that is clouding you from seeing the truth, God is constantly going to teach you how to change perspectives and move this, whether it be, I'm going to get rid of this sin habit, I'm going to change this job, I'm going to quit reading this, I'm going to quit, I'm going to start this, and this will condition, and then you get, and it's like, wow, that, how did I not see that before? That's, that is the process of hearing God. Amen. So for this guy, I want to look at kind of the action quotes that he gives, like his mindset of taking the... Now, so what if he'd not done anything with all the separations? Because it probably was hard work to do that. God might ask you to do something that's going to require you to work, to follow up, not to earn the righteousness, not to work for approval, but to put into action what he's leading, right? What's in your hands? What's in your house? What jars of oil do you have that you're willing to put into his hands? What, what, where is it in your life what do you have? What are you doing? What are you working with that can, you can invite him into and watch him increase? Dream with him a little bit. So these are some other insights into how he sees moving forward, let's say. No individual has any right to come into the world and go out of it without leaving behind him a distinct, without, uh, distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. Pretty cool. Most people search high and wide for the key to success if they only knew the key to their dreams lies within. Amen. This, is, this is one of the reasons why spirit-led, active, what, this is such a weird word, but people that are charismatic get a lot of ridicule from churches that are not 
because we're so flaky sometimes. We're running to get this something from this revival and had this emotional experience and it contradicts the Word of God here. And it's like, you can have both. You can have a very mature, well-established relationship with the Spirit of the living God where you're active in the gifts, rooted in sound doctrine, standing on His Word in truth. Amen? Amen. It's possible. And without running all over the place, but, but, but it starts with knowing this. He's in you. You are complete in Him. There's nothing out there that you need that will bring you to a place of completeness inwardly. There might be things out there that help you realize how complete you are in here, but nothing out there will bring you to a place of completion. Only Christ in you. And he knew that, you know. He's not really preaching. These are, see, what I love about this is these are spiritual truths that he just experiences. He may not even know chapter and verse for something like that. You know what I mean? But it doesn't matter because it's a reality that's in God that transcends somebody having written it down, not invalidating the word. You see what I'm saying? We're talking about a spiritual truth. It's just, he just knew it. 99% of the failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. How many of you got teenagers? You have to teach them. I don't need you to give me excuses. Let's just deal with the reality of the situation here, right? But we should do that to ourselves. Start where you are, with what you have, make something of it, and never be satisfied. Now, don't get religious on me about the never be satisfied thing. He's just talking about desiring to continue to see God move, right? That's what he's talking about. Do what you can with what you have now, with what you have, do it now. Do what you can with what you have. Do it now. See, because that, doing that, are the little steps that you need to take to be disciplined and taught and led and shaped and molded. And you learn and you tune and you grow and you understand how the process works for you. If you do it now, you're stepping and you're engaging in this long-term educational, discipline-oriented process with God that shapes you into a confident follower of Christ, standing on His Word, making decisions without second-guessing every decision you make in your life. Do it now. Say now. 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 I, love what he's, I love what he's getting at here. So we'll just end with a couple of passages and ideas here. This is just the first part of Psalm 4610, but the principle remains, be still and know that I'm God. I think that's what he's doing. He's stilling himself. He's settling himself. He's going out into the woods. I've got this problem here that's going to affect the world, ultimately, crop rotation. And what do we, what's going on, God? What, what, you know, how, do, how do I get to He's being still? And he knows. See, because he knows that God is a wisdom provider, right? What do you know about God that you're going to let yourself focus on when you're still? Like, are you still confused about maybe who God might be because of what you've been through? Or are you just going to wipe all that away and say, you know what, this is who God says He is. This is who I know God to be. I'm going to be still. I'm going to be still and focus on that is who God is. Provider, healer, redeemer, deliverer. All of those things that God has revealed Himself to be, you be still and you know that. And you don't let temporary, carnal, external stuff come in and sow seeds in your heart that are going to keep you from actually believing that that's who God really is. And you stand on that. You're basically just choosing to believe that God is who He says that He is, regardless of circumstances. And you will see the reality of that, and he, you will respond to Him. And that character of Him will be birthed and reflected back into this world in your life. So really, you don't even need to ask God for information. Just focus on who He is. Convince your heart of who He is. Like, do you have any doubt that God could fill every jar on the planet with that little bottle of oil? Okay, so what about your situation? Why do you have doubts in your situation? 
that God can be unlimited? It's a good question. Last one. And this is from the Young's Literal Translation. Young's Literal Translation is, per, is like people argue over it. Like if you want the most accurate translation, you better learn how to read Greek and Hebrew. And you better find the right texts because there's a bunch of them. Uh, so this is Young's Literal Translation, which is a interlinear, which a lot of places when you read Young's Literal Translation, it doesn't make grammatical sense in English because it's kind of just taken straight out of the Greek and into English without being reworded to please our ears, which is what most of those translations do. I'm not saying they're wrong, but they're translations. And this is just a, as direct of a translation as you can get. And the reason I'm making a big deal about that is because of this passage here. And how you interpret what this is saying in terms of how God relates to you tells me a lot about how you think God works in your life. The heart of man devises his way, and Jehovah establishes his steps. Most of you have probably been taught, <laughs> you've got your plans. God's going to do what he wants to do. don't really matter what your plans are. God's going to do what he wants to do. Ah, you weak, little, silly, little man over here, you're going to make your plans. But yeah, no, you know what, God's going to... That don't really matter. It don't really matter what your plans are, because God's going to do what he wants to do. You ever heard it that way? Yeah. That's wrong. Now... God has a way and a will that He wants that you might not be on board with, and you might make plans that are not in agreement with His will. But what this is saying is you come up with plans in your heart, and God shows you the steps to see it accomplished. Of course, godly, truth-based, word agreement plans, consistent with, you know what I'm saying? You come up with it in your heart, God shows you how to get there. Right. Elisha, I need help. What do you got? Got some oil. All right, go get some pots. Let's fill them. It's as simple as that. Right. What are the jars and pots that you need to go get and put in place and, and, and then focus on who God really is? Because He'll fill them. He'll fill them with patience and wisdom and love and kindness and joy and meekness long-suffering, all that stuff that you need internally. He'll fill it with the holiness that is already in your spirit that spills out into your character in this life. And to increase even beyond that, He will sow into you so that you can be a blessing in every way and be generous in every way. Well, I mean, Christians, you know, we should just be annoying at how generous we are. Like, well, there go those Christians again, buying people's houses and buying tires for women who, widows and taking care of this. There they, I, you know, I don't agree with what they, their beliefs are, but man, they really do do some great things. All these hospitals, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we limit God and then, and then we think God doesn't want you to have a bunch of money to be a blessing. It's like you're supposed to be a blessing and be generous, but don't, 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 don't get too much money. Well, God can fill every jar on the planet with one jar of oil. What does He want to do through you? You know, that's just this whole idea. Man, let's stop limiting Him. Let's open up to Him. Let's desire that He live fully through us. Let's desire that we express His will. Let's desire that we are so shaped into His image that we live on this planet like Jesus did and like God would want to. Ultimately, what God is going to do, He's going to be incredibly generous on this planet. Restore this place. Wipe away all sickness. Wipe away all fear. Take it to eliminate everything that keeps us from enjoying life forever. That's what, that's what He's wanting to do. Us buying tires for a widow or paying some doctor bills or helping somebody this or meet, drilling a well, those are all <laughs> reflections of what God wants to do. But that's just the smallest part of it, really. Bringing them into the understanding of His love for them so that they open up and let Him put His Spirit within them is why we do all that stuff. Yes. But we limit Him so much. We just limit Him so much. And then we come up with goofy doctrines of why you should limit Him. I don't want to do that. I want God to be a overflowing river, raging river through me that is not limited in any way. 
That's what I want. That's what this guy's story helps me do. Take those limits off. Get more jars ready. Get some more jars ready. People say it to me still time. They're like, you know, it'd be a lot more fun if we just had the one service. Well, it would be, but that's limiting God. That's right. We're making room because people keep showing up and you watch. You just watch. God wants this place to be a blessing in this community and in the world, and we don't want to limit Him just because we want to have fun and see our friends. That was kind of mean. I didn't, I didn't really... <laughs> you know what I mean. Jesus, let's pray. Father, we love You. We trust You. We don't want to limit You. I thank You for the life of George Washington Carver that we can look at him. We can gain insights of how You commune with a man how you commune with us and, 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 and what he recorded for us and the things that he put into practice. I thank you for men like him and women like him that have put into practice your inspiration that we can look at and be inspired ourselves to take the limits off and trust you. Show us where to get more jars. Show us where we're limiting you. All right, now, here's what I want you to do. Remember one thing, you can keep your eyes closed or open, whatever works for you. Remember one thing that was said today that you, that you actually remember that was interesting or inspiring to you. All right, think of one thing. I want everybody to participate here. Think of one thing that you remembered today. You got it? Yes. All right, now think of your life in an area where you need to see growth and increase and let that one thing show you how to proceed in that area of life. Some of you may see it. Some of you may not see it. Some of you may not use your imagination that way. It's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with you if you don't. For you, it might be you just get in the Word and read it, and it says it, and you do it. That's fine, too. But you're engaging your heart. And like George Washington Carver, got these insights. You get them, too. Now, God will reveal to you your next step. All right, everybody open your eyes. Raise your hand if you feel like you got the slightest insight of what that next step might be. Just lift up your hand. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, next week I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and ask you if you actually did it. I'm serious, if I remember. But, but do it. Do it. Amen? The lights are blinking, so that means it's time to stop. Anyway, love you guys. Appreciate you. Do it.